Okay. So while Annie's getting mic'd up, I'll tell you the story from how this happened. I'm involved in DevConf because I'm very passionate about open hardware, and I know nothing about hardware, so I thought I'll organize a conference and learn more about it. Um, while so organizing this, last year I met Andy and his crew, um, including Steve McIntyre and B. Dale and Mad Dog, I think I also attended their talks. Um, and that was my first introduction to it. This year when Andy came um, on Saturday, we did a, a beer trip, <laughs> I guess. We went to a brewery. Yeah, it was pretty good. It was um, awesome. Do you want to tell about Yeah, so, so this is just between Botrova and Hermanus. And um, the guys, the brewery's called Hoenenklip, and the guy brewing it is Mark Tamorstazen. I think you need to come here. B-Dale, you need to come here. Do what? <laughs> yeah, you can take a seat shot. if you want. <laughs> you can just pitch in whenever you want to. Um, and he runs his brewery on Linux. Um, problem here. So we were talking about how do we get involved in open hardware. And the easiest way is to start with a project. So I thought, well, I'm busy building a house. Let's make a smart home because then you can have hardware and sensors and monitors and everything. And that really got Andy annoyed. <laughs> do you want to tell us why? Um, well, I get really annoyed with silos. Um, do people know what I mean by silos? You should tell blank, them. Blank, blank, blank faces. <coughs> um, various different companies are jumping on this bandwagon which is being uh, marketed as the Internet of Things. And what they're actually doing is they're trying to get you to buy their product and their product alone. And so they have... Um, a device, a hub of some description, which will only talk to um, their own devices or devices in their own ecosystem and their, <coughs> their club of friends. And they tend to stick everything online. It goes into another buzzword, the cloud. And then two, three, four years later, when their little experiment hasn't succeeded, they drop the server services in the cloud and you're left holding a bunch of hardware which may or may not continue to work. Mm. That's a bit wrong. We've bought the hardware, we expected it to work, we've been sold something, <coughs> and it doesn't. So that's an issue about how open, open hardware is, isn't it? Well, this, this is why you, we need open hardware, mm. we need open software. Is, uh, the corporates are not doing this. Mm. But then we had this big discussion about what is open <laughs> Yeah. When it comes to hardware, because hardware has a physical thing associated to it, and, and there was there was a thing about um, that software scales exponentially. So once you make it available, you could really share it. But there's always a cost associated with hardware, and that creates a tension with how open it is. Is that correct? Uh, to an extent. I mean, you've been involved in in, in various projects that you've done as hard, open. Genuinely. If you push your own design out there, um, the reason you've developed it in the first place is you've got a particular itch and you want to scratch it. So you, you, you sit and work on something, maybe you, you, you call some people who have um, a background in electronics or maybe you're experimenting for the first time. You put something together, you get it working and you share it with the world. But in order to get any feedback, in order to um, contribute back into that project, typically you are going to end up building hardware which has a physical cost, particularly if you're experimenting on something that you've never done before. And there is also a very long lead time. With software, you can jump straight in. You can hack around a bit. If it doesn't work, you can blow it away. You can try again. With hardware, it's to start off with, that's, that's fine. You can sit there on breadboard. You can... You can, you can cobble a few bits and pieces together. You can let the magic blue smoke out of the occasional transistor and vet as you build something. But when you start getting to a uh, system on chip or more and more highly integrated devices, then you're putting them on quite a complicated PCB. Mm -hmm. And the lead times of that PCB manufacturing is quite hard. And so, yeah, you, you need to be working together as a group. Mm -hmm. um, and that got us to the, well, what actually is open? Is it open if you just push right. your <clears throat> so circuit the, diagram? Yeah, there's a bunch of different ways to think about this, right? Because on one level, <clears throat> you know, I've been really excited over the last few years with the explosion of 
you know, sort of maker projects, people yeah. uh, publishing information on Hackaday or wherever else about something that they did that they thought was interesting, they thought was cool. The problem, of course, is that a lot of these are somebody's first attempt ever to do something like this. And so on one hand, it's really exciting to see them getting excited and learning how to use some sort of building block bits and pieces. But a lot of the things that people come up with are very, very far away from something that you would want to reproduce en masse, either because yeah. it's not an efficient way to do it for many copies or um, because there's something flaky about it that they're willing to deal with in their environment, but which people who you know are not as passionate about the making of the thing might not be willing to tolerate. And potentially, we've got a series of standards and uh, well, and localized legislation you have to comply with. And the and the hacker ethic and the maker culture have always been sort of tied up in figuring out how to use what's easily available to you to do something that maybe the people who designed those bits didn't originally envision. And while that's really, really cool, it doesn't always scale very well. Yeah. And so in my experience, the thing that people end up sort of stumbling with is how do you go from something that's easy to do in a one-off kind of way to something that you could replicate in a way that would be you know, very broadly applicable and lots of people could take advantage mm -hmm. of. In fact, with the avionics stuff that Keith and I work on, um, the thing that I think has caused us to be successful selling rocket avionics boards is that the stuff we build is actually pretty complicated to make physically. <clears throat> it's you know a very fine pitch surface mount technology, yeah. and that's not nearly as scary as a lot of folks think it is. But no. to to do them and sort of have them be reliable does take a certain amount of, of experimentation and expertise. Um, and those and circuit boards themselves, I mean, they're not. It's got to the point where. But realistically, but, you're not going to build those yourself. You're going to, you're going to send that away to a third party company to, but, but to even, manufacture. But even more importantly, the average person playing around with high power rocketry has something else that's their primary focus. For yeah. Keith and for me, it's really rocketry these days is a lot about the electronics and the telemetry and the kind of data we can collect and the ways we can help other people, particularly students, being able to do cool things that they couldn't do otherwise. But we have a lot of friends who are really good at making propellant, and their thing is all about changing the chemistry of the propellant. And they almost would like for somebody else to build the rocket, and they certainly don't want to have to design and build circuit boards and in you've order got to fly the, things. And you've got the hobby flyers who want to buy an airframe, and, and buy, just, buy the kit, and right. buy the propellant from somebody else. So you've right. got the makings of a complete community. Right. So the, 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 way, the place that this gets really hard, though, so you, know, you talk about um, smart home things. Um, you're absolutely right that every major company out there that would like to play in that consumer space wants to figure out the thing that's going to cause their products to be sticky and desirable to customers. And a lot of times that means that if they had their preference, they would build everything with some sort of a proprietary local protocol and they would gateway to the internet at one place. There are a couple of working groups at the Linux Foundation now that are trying to fight against that and trying to build industry consensus on standardizing some of these protocols. And if you really care about that stuff at the sort of trying to shape the way the market works level, those would be good places to go get involved and try and drive thinking and behavior. The problem, of course, is that that's at sort of a macro industrial level, yeah. right? <clears throat> and so what do you do yourself? Well. I just finished building a greenhouse for my wife to replace the one we lost in the fire in 2013. And um, it's got a thermal control system. And shockingly, um, that's all done using open hardware and software bits. I did cheat a little bit. It's not 100% open, because there is a Raspberry Pi in the middle of it. And that still has one little binary blob, I believe. But um, you know, the control algorithm is about a page of Python that I mm -hmm. cobbled together from bits and pieces. Um, the sensors are simple things that are tacked onto GPIO lines. The controls are a couple of cheap Chinese solid state relays that I bought through Amazon. And you know, there's a fan and electrically operated louvers to open the vents and a four kilowatt <coughs> electric heater sitting in the middle of it. So, um, and, and the really amusing part is I found some lovely uh, temperature and you know, humidity and environmental control plotting stuff that was written by somebody in a marijuana grow facility somewhere in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> it's legal now, and there's this whole <coughs> sub-community of people uh, sort of encouraging each other to build more robust infrastructure for growing better yeah. marijuana. So uh, I, I really was just amused when I found this cute little chunk of code for, you know, 
creating web plots of mm -hmm. environmental data, and that's where it came from. Um, and of course, <clears throat> since it is for a greenhouse project, there's been lots of joking around the family about what my wife's actually growing in there. Or um, what she should be growing if she isn't. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Um, there are plenty of people who are really good at that in Colorado, and frankly, I would much rather have components for salsa. So there are poblanos and serranos and all kinds of herbs and. <clears throat> Tomatoes and yeah, it's a it's a it's a salsa greenhouse. So mostly. coming back to your the greenhouse, so anyway, your the point senses is, are this modular. Is to totally bespoke. Um, <clears throat> uh, no, I bought Dallas DS uh, eighteen B. So look, I'm I do electronics for fun, and you know I used yeah. to do it for a living, um, <clears throat> and. Uh, it, un, despite Keith's uh, beliefs, I am actually capable of writing software myself from time to time. <laughs> well, I did this time. I'll even show you the code if you want to see it. It's the first time I've written, I started with like an empty edit buffer and created like a whole page of Python myself. It's kind of exciting. Um, <clears throat> This is how you can tell I'm sort of an executive these days, right? Um, but no, I mean, it's fun because uh, simple temperature sensors, one wire temperature sensors, somebody else had written a library that talks to those yep. sensors on the Pi. That was easy. The solid state relays, come on, people. I'm wiggling a GPIO line. How hard can it be? Uh, it turns out in <laughs> Python, you haven't to us another library. So um, whatever. <clears throat> but it all works just brilliantly. And uh, it took me you know, one afternoon uh, to go from getting the hardware all sort of hooked together mm -hmm. Uh, and by the way, if you're interested, um, yes, of course, like all of my things, that's an open hardware design. And this, I do actually have a schematic for what I wired up around the Pi. And I have not bothered pushing it out to my web yet because I was busy off playing with my parents and a good friend doing a rocket cert last weekend instead. So, so, so this fits in really nicely with what we were talking on Saturday. Um, and it came down to that things need to be appropriate for what you're doing. Like sometimes really simple things with just a page of Python code is really all you need. And I think that re lowers oh, the wife, barrier to entry. My wife is so happy with the fact that yeah. the greenhouse control system is just working. I mean, mm. it, it, it's not, look, it's not complicated code. And I say that in part because I used to write you know, factory floor automation code and things like this back in the days of my misspent youth. But it, it really, it's not complicated. And if anyone here uh, who's ever looked at Python before would look at it and probably laugh at my code, but um, you would in immediately see just how simple the problem is we're trying to solve. So yes, I think on one level, what I would love to see is lots more people encouraged to not get hung up about who they have to go buy stuff from yeah. and to realize that some of the things you want to do for yourself, you really can do for yourself by yourself. And it's actually a lot of fun hacking around with little bits of hardware and software Yeah, like I mean, this. let the magic loose work out. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, I think it's really important for us to realize that there is this huge mechanism involved in turning good ideas into mass-produced hardware. Yeah. And the support that's required for someone like you know my mother or your grandmother or whoever to be able to call on Sunday night and fi get help figuring out why the thing doesn't work. Um, and those are the sorts of things that cause you to have to stop and ponder where the threshold is between the stuff that you really want and need to have open versus the stuff that you're willing to let somebody have some mechanism for generating some kind of a revenue stream around. So in a team discussion over beer, we came up with four things about what it means to be open. This was also after many beers. <laughs> so, so, you know, I would like some feedback. It, it got a bit heated. <laughs> In more ways than one. Um, so what does it mean to be open? It means to be accessible, to be hackable, to give a how-to manual of the hardware, to say what they did and how the user could do the same thing. So basically explaining how it works. No. What do you think? Um, we were talking about in an absolute perfect ideal world. So in your ideal world, if, you, if you've got something and you want to start, there's so enough information somebody else can pick my, it up and learn. My answer to that is actually yes. <clears throat> To be open, you have to have some kind of documentation, even if all it is is an assertion of which open standards you're compliant with or something like that. And, and see, from my perspective, schematics and source code are documentation. So, yeah. So, so the, can, can we get to the schematics? Can I do two and more open, points? Yeah, Just okay, to finish okay. my four okay. points. Of course you can. So open is about the idea that you can at least try to reproduce something. doesn't matter how hard it is. You at least have the ability to get in there and try and to share your design and let other people comment on that design. So reproducibility is certainly one potential attribute of open, but it's not actually the attribute that most people care about most of the time. Because most people don't actually want to have to build the thing themselves when it comes to physical hardware. 
What most people want is the knowledge, the sure knowledge, the assertion, the, the guarantee that if they spend money buying a piece of hardware that somebody else doesn't have the ability to control when it becomes obsolete. And you know, in a perfect world, you'd buy a piece of hardware that had a completely open design, whose documentation came with schematics and bills of material and things like this. You know, like Hewlett Packard oscilloscopes used to back in the nineteen seventies and eighties, right? Beautiful reference manuals. You know, complete theory of operation in the back, so that you could actually repair your own instrumentation. It's a lovely point in history. I'm fortunate to have been around then. Um, the what they really care about is that you know somebody else going out of business doesn't all of a sudden make their home control system stop working. Yeah. I, I'll be honest with you, the things I worry more about are the, 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 the recent proliferation of devices that depend upon some piece of cloud infrastructure yeah. that's well, that not just open. might just go away. It's like, oh, well, that's really cute, and it does this really cool thing, and I don't have to put any infrastructure together. I just buy six of these and put them down, and hey, look, you know, I can point my phone at some random website, and now I can see what's going on in my house. Yeah. I mean, never um, mind the security implications of all of that, okay? And we can talk about that in this group for the whole week, I'm sure. But just think about what happens if that company goes belly up and that website goes away. It's not even when the company goes belly up. I mean, we've already seen examples of, um, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was one of the Google control systems where they no longer support the Mot1 API. So people who have gone and put their heating system, their lighting controllers and bits and pieces in, the hardware works absolutely fine, but the cloud services have gone. And so that is where a standard, an industry standard, could come in place to secure that? Yeah, <coughs> open standards really help in this area. Because you can then change your cloud so, so again, for something else. So again, this is where, to me, the definition of open is complicated, because it sort of depends on what you're trying to accomplish. <laughs> A lot of time what I really care about is making sure that if I think something is cool enough that I'm willing to put some of my hard-earned money down, that it's not going to somehow become unmaintainable or unsupportable later. That, to me, is one of the biggest concerns. So the freedom. And in fact, this is the thing, uh, for those of you who weren't there or haven't heard about it, I gave a talk at, was it this year? Yes, it was this year at Linux Conference Australia about the whole house audio system I built for a new house. And, you know, I... My contractor, we were building the house. Um, we told him we wanted you know, distributed uh, high quality audio through that, sort of background audio stuff, and uh, you know, music in whichever room you wanted it, kind of thing. And they spec'd a really cool looking system, fairly high end, ridiculously expensive, but irrelevant for this part of the discussion. Um, the feature set was pretty cool. Um, you know, it had apps for you know, your iOS or Android device order you could use to control it and all this sort of stuff. The problem was, being the kind of guy I am, I went and did a little quick due diligence on the manufacturer's website, and I couldn't find any documentation about what the con software contents of the system yeah. were. Um, I found sort of an owner's manual, operator's manual, and then I went to the support pages on the website, and buried down in there were a couple of screenshots of what the administrative interface to the box looked like, and there were terms in use on the screen that were unique to the way you configure network filtering in the Linux kernel. So does that come back to your schematics conversation? And so when I looked at this, I went, oh, um, this, this is like a 99.99 something percent probability there's a Linux kernel inside this thing. There's not a single mention of the GPL anywhere. Now, Ooh. in theory, you know, until I actually buy a box from them, they're not obligated to provide me anything yeah. under the GPL, right? So in theory, I could maybe have spent a lot of money and bought the product. And when it arrived, maybe it would have come with source code. Maybe it would have come with documentation of a written offer or something like this. But my expectation, based on the way the rest of the material is crafted, is I would spend a lot of money and be really unhappy at the end of the day, both because it appeared to me to be a blatant GPL violation and because they were wrapping it all up as a proprietary thing and not documenting any of this or telling me about the guts, which I might like to play with. So, of course, I rebelled. I ended up designing a cute little board that's sort of USB to 30-watt stereo audio. <laughs> and I built up nine of them and mounted them on a strip and put them up on the wall and bought a cheap Chinese power supply, which, by the way, required I buy an equivalently expensive ball-bearing fan to make the power supply possible to live with at night. <coughs> um, I wish you know another nickel spent on the bearings and the fan would have saved me a lot of hassle. Um, and there's actually a little Intel, um, what's the thing called? It's one, and I don't know what it's called. It's the. No, it's one of those 
little It's one of their little single board computers that uses uh, Atomy. Huh? The, no, the, like their, like, I think it was a Galileo or something. That's not the name of it, but yeah. <coughs> whatever. It's a little Intel architecture based embedded board that's just sitting there running Debian and a uh, hacked up version of Mopity. And my wife's really, really happy. But here's an example of where. Even before I purchased it, it occurred to me to care about these things. And I went and looked, and it was not hard for me to, you know, I didn't get absolute proof that there was a problem, but I certainly wasn't left with a warm fuzzy to go spend $12,000 on their hardware. And in fact, I think the hardware cost of my solution, even if I'd had to buy the little Intel board, would have been on the order of like 200 bucks. So. <laughs> Yeah, but then you have to assemble it and stuff, and then your time. Event, yes, so exactly. And yeah. for me, of course, this is this is the hobby part of it, right? This is why I was saying earlier. This is the thing that sort of differentiates those of us here. I mean, all of us enjoy hacking on stuff, or we wouldn't be involved in Debian on some level. <clears throat> and I suspect most of you in this room. I, the, so the little audio boards, yes, there was some serious electronic design part of that. And I will take credit for the fact that that's not something that anybody could just go do trivially. But <coughs> um, there are lots of projects like this where you really could go do a little bit of it. But there's a huge distance between I can do this once and make it work for me, and what does it take to actually deliver something in industrial volumes? Uh, Keith and I struggle figuring out how to get an economical production run done of a tiny little thing at 1,000 unit quantities. Mm -hmm. the, the, just the, the logistics. I mean, you, know, you, you get done with the design, you have a working prototype, and then you have to do the other 90% of the work. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's my day job. So I'm completely and, and, aware and, of that. And, and so um, on some level, uh, I have sympathy for people who want to find some way to hook you to ensure that once you, they've spent a lot of money investing and developing and all that, that they have some way to recoup that investment. But that sympathy does not extend as far as you can lock me out of the ability to have control over the life cycle of that in my own use. Yeah. And to me, that's the really important thing is do I or does someone else control what the life cycle is this is going to be? So you, one of the things we said was documentation. We said, you know, a schematic is a, a good start point and so knowledge of the APIs is a, a really good start point. But working on an open, on an open hardware project, do you just give the schematic and say that that's it uh, as a team, uh, as, as your project, we just give the schematic away and that's enough? Or do we need to give more than just the schematic? Um, I mean, the number of projects that I've seen which are allegedly open and the, 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 the schematic is a PDF. It's, yeah, I've got a circuit diagram. Um, they, well, so might give the, away, they might give away some Gerbers. If, you're, if your purpose is you to ensure that someone else can write code that works with that hardware, then a schematic might suffice. Yeah. On the other hand, I suspect that even if you had the schematics of a TiVo, you still would need the keys to, to cryptographically sign the kernel before the service would actually function for you. And so it really, again, it kind of depends on what you need. Uh, Keith and I make uh, schematics and Gerbers and drill files and bill of material stuff available for all of our designs. And we know that that's sufficient because we've had people come up to us at rocket launches with clones of our products asking us for some little, sheepishly asking if we would be willing to help them with the one little thing they didn't quite understand. So let's just get, somebody's coming up to you, they've bought a clone of a board that you've designed. No, they, they've, they've made it themselves. They've made it, oh, they've made it themselves. That's they, even, they, okay, that's they, even, they that's downloaded cool. the Gerbers and the drill files. They sent them off to a board shop. They had raw boards made. They downloaded our bill of materials, which has all of the distributor part numbers and everything, you know, DigiKey and Mauser part numbers in the US. <laughs> and they placed orders and bought the parts. And they sat down and placed them all themselves and refloated it in an electric skillet or something. And they turned it on. And it kind of seemed to work. And they don't understand why they can't hear the RF. And it's just because they didn't know they need to calibrate the frequency. But that's, that's just that, <clears> the, <throat> yeah. the grin on your face when somebody comes up with something. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. So, so as Keith was saying earlier, I don't think the first person who did that to us was expecting our response, which was immense glee. We were so ecstatic that somebody had actually like built a clone of one of the things because it was proof positive that our assertions that we're open hardware guys it was true so it's not just chuck it on the internet on your website here's my here's my, here's my um the, my files and nobody looks at it people are actually going out there they're searching this when when the the, the website uh when the search engine boys <coughs> crawl crawl your site 
I don't know. I, I don't know in this case if it's as much that or as much people at launch. Well, it seems somebody else playing. Go, that's really cool, and they go look and they go, wow, this is open. I've always wanted to learn how to like place parts mm -hmm. and reflow surface mount myself. Here's a known working design I can start from, and it'll be something really cool to play with when I'm mm -hmm. done. Yeah. I don't know exactly what the motivations are. I don't so, think I would struggle mm -hmm. with our boards. <laughs> <laughs> Should we take some questions, comments from the audience? Yeah, it'd be much more yeah. interesting yeah. if we did. <coughs> I think Sam's got the first one. Sam. So, Hang on, we've got a microphone coming to you. Hi. Should I turn on this It's on. It's on. Okay. Um, so, Sam Hartman, I guess, you know, this is all great that you hear this, this wonderful discussion of open hardware. I'm a software guy. I would love to have control of the life cycle stuff like Bidel's talking about. But like even really hooking something up to a GPIO line is actually a little bit more than I'm going to easily be able to do. That's OK. I can't write kernel code. Uh, yeah, no, right. But how do I, like, how would I go about, let's say I wanted to have a, um, you know, home audio system. That would be really actually totally awesome. I'm happy to handle the software side of it. What are my options for getting something that meets BDale's open lifecycle requirement? Well, so Keith and I were talking on the flight down about whether I should build and sell some of my audio boards. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's get, it, find, find that community. Find the people who are already doing it and look at what they're doing. So I think the challenge is uh, when you go looking for components to put together to create a system, you ought to be asking these questions about all of the components you're picking. And by components, you know, I could be talking about, you know, a server. I could be talking about, you know, some integrated sensor box or something. Um, and, and there's different levels of openness. And this is what I think I was trying to get to earlier. It really depends on what you're trying to do. For some people, knowing that I can put this on the net and it speaks IP, and if I ask it a query in this particular format, I'll get the temperature and the humidity and the barometric pressure and all of that back, is open enough. They don't actually care about the schematic. What they want to know is that they can talk to that box with their own computing infrastructure. And Sam, you know, that might be the sort of threshold that, that meets what you're talking about. Uh, it, it, in, in other places in the spectrum, there are people, you know, going back to our rocket avionics stuff, Keith and I have been totally thrilled that there are high school teams and college teams that are taking our designs and hacking the firmware and adding additional sensors. And, you know, w part of the cool thing about being totally open like this and willing to talk to people about what we've done is we're enabling other people to then sort of explicitly go build on top of that and sort of use our stuff as the big piece at the middle of the erector set or the, the Lego set or whatever. And, uh, and that's just immensely cool. It's immensely gratifying. And you know, at this age and stage of my life, seeing people learn <coughs> from what we've done is almost as gratifying as anything else we do. So for, so for some, <coughs> what, what, what are we suggesting then? Find, find, find a community of people who are already doing uh, much of this? Or? Do, do a little research before you whip your wallet out. Yeah. <coughs> before spending money, you know, make conscious decisions about the stuff you're buying. Uh, if it, if you buy it because it's shiny, and uh, you know, uh, I guess you get uh, what you get. Yeah, in two weeks' time, it won't be available anymore. So yeah, uh, hard to say. Anybody else? I used to love to go to ham radio flea markets when I was younger because it was really exciting to find some sort of one-off random piece of stuff and take it home and sort of reverse engineer it, figure it out, and do something really cool with it. Yeah. And I have to admit that uh, at this later stage in my life, I don't find that nearly as exciting as I do figuring out how to create something that satisfies one of my own personal needs and desires and enables other people to be able to do now something I cool. I kind too. of find the thrill of taking something, you know, I myself have done some ham radio stuff, and I do find that the technology has moved so far forwards now that it's getting harder and harder to understand. Uh, a radio you buy because everything ends up oh, as an yeah, SOC yeah. I, I, and it's, everything has got higher and higher level of integration <clears throat> and it's getting harder to um, produce or hack on something because it is now just so, one so, so, so I, would, I would actually argue that with you. Um, it's absolutely true that my, I, have, I have friends in Cuba that years ago, um, when they came to a conference in the US, I sent them home with a, a tube full of mini circuits, doubly balanced mixers, and some oscillator chips, and things like this. 
And I knew that every sort of set of rough components I sent home would get one more person on the 50-ish megahertz six yeah. meter band. And that was a totally cool thing to do. But at the other end of the spectrum, uh, I have a bunch of friends in the ham radio world who all just went in on the crowd supply Lime SDR software defined radio boards. Yep. I mean, that's, that's a very complex piece of kit, but it is completely documented, schematics, artwork, all that stuff is, has been released. And everyone I know that's buying one of those and wants to hack on it is interested in writing radio code, you know, software, and they're going to hook a couple antennas up to it, and that's a building block that they're using. And the fact that most of them don't actually really care about the details of the hardware or what it takes to lay out a circuit board so that it's got fidelity from 100 kilohertz to 3.8 gigahertz. That, that, this again, it's sort of, uh, what uh, do you care about what matters? So. If, if, so I think we've probably seen the same thing from different viewpoints, is if you want to hack on something and change its functionality from a software point of view, the the higher integration is fine, providing you've got, you've got access to it. Right. If you're wanting to hack on something from a, purely as a hardware to experiment, to play, and actually understand the hardware, that's getting harder on off-the-shelf products because they are more and more integrated. Um, you know, if you're wanting something for longevity, but, but, but don't buy an SOC. But it's interesting because on the flip side, the availability of well-documented SOCs is now allowing makers to build things that they couldn't have ever built before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, I'm, I, I, so, so I, I completely hear what you're saying. And it's very interesting that um, after the fire, when I went to rebuild my RF test bench, I found myself buying test equipment, mostly that was designed in the 1980s. And the reason is that was about as recent as you can go when things were still really general purpose. I mean, I bought a vector network analyzer and I bought a spectrum analyzer that just allow you to look at the RF. Yeah. Since then, the thing that's become really cool is to put more and more levels of abstraction and sophistication mm -hmm. on top of that. So now if you go buy an RF analyzer, you sort of need to go in knowing, am I going to use this for, for looking at GPRS? Am I going to use this for, you know, what, what, what radio thing am I trying to do and what protocols do I care about? Because what the vendors want to sell you is something that's optimized for helping you understand a deeper slice yeah. through a taller stack. And, and also, and and also the thing that you're buying is... you can't actually just look at the spectrum from DC to 26. The thing you're also buying is a, is, a, is a broad range sensor. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it gets straight into the digital domain, and, you, and it's processed in software. On the flip side, today, you can go to somewhere like Seed Studio and buy a little digital signal oscilloscope or a digital sampling oscilloscope or a little logic analyzer board for 50 bucks or something that will allow you to diagnose and troubleshoot things that I could not have afforded the test yeah. equipment for in 1986. Very so much. Uh, it goes both ways. Yeah. Great. So closing statement, where do you think hardware is going, open hardware is going in the next couple of years, or anything else you would like to close the session with? Well, I'm really excited that there are now a number of companies in the world that are making a point of being open hardware companies that are north of 10 million a year in revenue, i.e. they're like becoming real companies. Um, I'm personally really pleased to be on the board of directors of Aleph Objects, which is the parent company of Lulzbot, who provided the 3D printer stuff that you see out in the hall. In fact, my son is working there this summer, so I have a fair amount of connection with them. Uh, and by the way, I had nothing to do with the fact that they sent hardware. That's imme immensely cool and done on their own part. But I think we are now seeing enough examples of real companies that are being really successful following a truly open model to believe that they're not just random unicorns, that this is a structural model that can work. But so I think, we're, we're beginning to see it in the commercial space. But I, but, but, but I think so far we've only seen it work in specialty kinds of product spaces. Uh, but it's getting there. Yeah, it would be really nice to think it's going to ripple out more. Uh, you know, but when I can go into a retail outlet and have my choice of open design Wi-Fi access points or open design home automation pieces, then I'll be a believer right now. I think there's a whole bunch of hurdles left before the industry at large understands that they can be more open and still make money. And from the hobbyist point of view, where, where are we now? Well, I personally, you know, everything I hack on at home is open. I just, life's too short for secret source software. Great. Andy, last statement from you? It's, it's, it's uh, I 
pretty much agreeing entirely with Peter on this. Um, perhaps I'm still seeing from the the hacking side for, uh, f from individuality that we're you know open hardware is I still think 20 years behind the open software movement. Mm -hmm. We're still in the shareware stage, and we're just beginning to come out of shareware and start to see um, collaborative projects. Great. Um, but finding them is still few and far between. And we'll work on it. I guess the other thing I would think about is that a lot of things that used to be perceived as really difficult, complex manufacturing processes are now available in job shop form. Oh, Not only are there places... The make spaces and that type of... Yeah, but I mean, there helping. are companies now where you can upload a design file and get back laser cut or 3D printed or CNC machined parts and one-offs. It costs some money, but I mean, you, you can design and that something... that is true of PCBs as well. I mean, there's plenty and, of yeah, people doing... Yeah, circuit boards. If you want to get raw circuit boards, if you want to give somebody bill materials and have them do surface mount assembly. Um, so by the way, there's job opportunities on both sides of that. You know, you can find another niche that somebody's not filling and go provide a service like that, become an expert on something. And on the front side, it's actually more possible to hack than it used to be. Right. I think we've got one last question. Yeah, one, two questions and then we close. Do we need a universal IoT platform to break the silos? Is this a necessary component? Do we need IoT? <laughs> look, look, I mean, you, you get to decide what level. Um, a universal platform. I don't know that I care so much about our landing on a singular one of anything as much as I care about the things that we end up adopting en masse having some degree of openness. I mean, my biggest concern with IoT isn't necessarily even openness. It's the, co the massive commercial pressures to have your sensors and actuators so cheap that any semblance of security goes out the window and people who are uh, peddling those sort of sensors um, and it's becoming to be included in clinical you know, healthcare at home do not care about any security of any type and the platform is so think... cheap you can't actually put it on there. It's been thought of too mm -hmm. late. So, I guess so you, you get these platforms that are developed within big corporations or big vendors, but then are we going to, is it going to be a big vendor that comes up with the platform that everybody ends up using? Or what, what is the, um, I mean, what is the space for an open source project to, or a free software project to guide, um, guide those vendors <coughs> So there are at least two working groups at the Linux Foundation that are tackling open protocols for IoT space, and they have a long list of corporate participants. Uh, I would strongly suggest you go take a look at those projects and see what's happening, because those are places where people who are passionate about it and have some knowledge and interest can actually help define the standards that industries will end up adopting. Great. And on that point, yeah. I hope that this creates a lot more conversation in the corridors and throughout the week. Yeah, if I'm not too busy, we'll talk over a bit. Yeah, and I'm I want to thank you very busy. much for joining me on this panel. Great, thank you. Thank you. Great.